Hello, it's my great pleasure to be invited to present uh, the Innovasal. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Paolo Cassano, and uh, I'll be presenting on photobiomodulation for depression roadmap towards uh, dose definition. These are my disclosures. Um, I currently um, have a conflict of interest with one company, which is Nerex Light Therapeutics. So when you think about light, uh, uh, this is uh, how you expose yourself to the light in Brazil. Now, um, it's quite different from uh, what happens in New England, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, that's how we get to the light. And as you can tell, uh, regardless of how warm it is outside, we uh, kind of like to cover up a little more and uh, sometimes also cover our head more. So um, whether it's at noon or whether it's later in the day, people make choices uh, how much skin they expose to light, uh, how much surface, and also about the timing of when they go. Uh, so do they go on purpose uh, early in the morning when the light is less intense or rather at noon when it is more intense. So uh, that's uh, a picture to uh, kind of explain that uh, even more and exemplify um, how we expose ourselves to sunlight. Well, some of the same uh, uh, debate uh, is present in the field of light therapy. And uh, fortunately, we're not the only ones uh, to be fairly contentious uh, these days. Now, um, to keep up with the metaphor of the donkey and the elephant, uh, well, even in our field, uh, we have uh, strong opinions uh, about uh, surface uh, of exposure, um, intensity of the light, of course, time matters as well. So, can we find some agreement here? Can we find at least a roadmap ahead when we think about light therapies, about how to dose them? Well, we talk about light, but um, I'd like to mention what exactly I mean by light and what's the context here. Um, we are all familiar with uh, visible light, uh, the light that is absorbed by the plants, uh, um, and uh, we are, for course, uh, uh, familiar with the bright light therapy that has been, uh, as part of the visible, uh, largely employed for um, therapeutic purposes in depression. As a matter of fact, depression is our topic today. However, there are other types of light, uh, high energy, um, the UV that we fear and um, have uh, mutagenic uh, properties and also stimulates vitamin D production. But today we're actually thinking below the visible, an invisible light uh, that is uh, um, below the visible but very close to uh, the visible and therefore it's called uh, infrared, near infrared, as it is close to the red wavelength. So this light has interesting properties. It penetrates uh, fairly deeply depending on the intensity, uh, much more than uh, uh, the actual uh, visible light, and uh, can penetrate up to one centimeter into the brain and sometimes more, again, depending on the intensity of the light. And it, it's interesting that uh, it has specific photoacceptors, uh, and uh, those are um, uh, at the level of the mitochondria. And uh, uh, these photoacceptors actually um, uh, are part of the respiratory chain, and uh, uh, the energy of the light is absorbed by the mitochondria and transform in readily available energy for the cell. This seems to be the primary mechanism. There are many other mechanisms for the effect of the light and uh, um, there is still a lot of debate in the field 
about what are the key mechanisms when it becomes um, an issue of uh, brain and effects. Uh, so this is a close-up on the respiratory chain and what you see in the circle up there is the cytochrome C oxidase um, which is the main photoacceptor. Here is uh, uh, an enlargement of that picture. Now, um, as I said, the field is uh, somewhat divided. So let's take uh, uh, this picture here. You see on the y-axis is the intensity of the light or irradiance. At the bottom is the surface um, uh, of exposure or the area or window of exposure. Now, in the field, uh, um, some of the treatment and maybe the very early treatment for depression were focusing on high intensity and small surface. And then uh, the field has also contemplated, and we'll see it later, a kind of lower intensity. And typically when you get to lower intensity, the surface use is higher. And that's obviously to allow enough energy to be delivered. But so let's take a peek at the very first trials here. So um, this was uh, a little more than uh, 10 years ago now uh, when uh, uh, colleagues here in, uh, in Boston and McLean Hospital used this uh, uh, first treatment uh, um, for in 10 patients with treatment resistant depression with high radiance and uh, a very tiny surface. Um, and uh, what they did, as you can see here, uh, there was this, this black device uh, that you see on the upper right corner here of uh, the picture. Um, they shed one spot on the right and one spot on the left. Um, and uh, uh, what they saw with one treatment, a remarkable decrease of the uh, depression rating scores at two weeks uh, with 40% uh, uh, of the uh, patient being responders uh, on the Hamilton 21. Now, uh, if you think about that this was actually treatment resistant depression, this was quite an interesting and, and noticeable result. Uh, unfortunately, one treatment uh, didn't quite uh, lead to lasting effect. Uh, in the following two weeks, you can see that uh, um, the symptoms uh, and the scores of depression were trending up again. Interestingly, the same study showed that uh, when the light was off, uh, the blood flow in, at the brain level uh, was low, but when the light was on, uh, the blood flow in increased uh, suddenly. And uh, that was shown with um, FNIR's uh, technology. So an immediate effect on uh, cerebral blood flow. There was a, then a study years later that also looked at high radiance and small surface uh, and looked at the uh, potential augmentation of a technique uh, that's called attention bias modification that is uh, basically uh, a way of um, swaying the attention of the patient from negative content. Of course, uh, the press patients uh, will be pessimistic and will be very negative. Uh, and so uh, that treatment uh, was w with uh, um, high radiance and a very small surface. Here you can see the laser pointing to fairly small area that is here um, kind of highlighted in red. What they saw was that when they were shedding sham there was really um, minimal effect uh, on the depressive symptoms. Uh, here um, you have to think that this is the sequence uh, People were receiving the attention bias modification, then they were receiving uh, the treatment with the near infrared light, uh, and they had two sessions um, done uh, in, in basically a couple of days. And then uh, they were looking at the effect on depressive symptoms two weeks later. And so there was a modest effect with the sham, 
and uh, when they were shedding the real light on the right side, the effect depended on whether um, the um, attention bias modification had been uh, a successful psychotherapeutic intervention or not. So if the negative bias was significantly reduced by um, the psychotherapeutic intervention, then the light was uh, strongly affected and had that kind of deep, uh, dark column with a strong decrease in uh, depressive symptoms at two weeks. Uh, interestingly, if you did the same on the left side, um, you know, with near infrared light, it didn't really matter, there wasn't much of an effect. So this introduced a new concept. Uh, one is uh, the uh, near infrared light uh, with high intensity and a small surface. Uh, even few treatments uh, um, could be effective uh, depending on the state of the brain function or the psychological state, if you wish, in this case. Location matter, in this case, was the right better than the left. However, um, again, uh, one or two treatments uh, uh, wasn't enough to have an impact regardless of the uh, particular state of the brain in terms of psychological state. And again, it showed to us that uh, um, probably one or two sessions are not enough uh, when you're using a high radiance uh, and small surface. Then in the field, um, there have there been other groups that have looked at uh, uh, varying um, surface, so keeping now the radiance low and varying surface. So either having a large surface of irradiance or having a small surface of irradiance. And uh, um, what I'm talking about, as a matter of fact, is our group in Mass General Hospital. Um, we had started um, and we, uh, we really wanted to look at high radiance and this was our proof of concept study. Um, however, we're unfortunately um, by um, the course of events swayed from this high radiance as uh, uh, the device that we had chosen for high radiance uh, um, to shed the light on the forehead was from a company that ended up bankrupting it. And uh, uh, so therefore we, we decided to, to change our device uh, and uh, we ended up with uh, a low irradiance device with large surface. Uh, fortunately, um, this is the setup of the device. So you see fairly uh, large square of light uh, um, bilaterally with the infrared light. And fortunately, the, the effect was still uh, quite remarkable. Here, um, we implemented multiple sessions, and uh, at six to eight weeks, uh, as you see in the active, the red line, there was a significantly decrease in uh, uh, depressive symptoms with this uh, um, repeated treatment. So these were twice a week treatment for eight weeks. Um, there was also a remarkable response rate of 50% uh, compared to 27% with uh, sham. Um, we were very encouraged and we went on uh, uh, with another study uh, also uh, with uh, uh, low irradiance. This was obviously our path. Um, this was now a multi-center study together with the group in NYU with uh, uh, Dana Josefesco. And uh, um, what we found with this study is uh, uh, this was a fairly complicated study with uh, 12 weeks of follow-up uh, um, 
and we had different groups here, uh, groups uh, that had uh, uh, near infrared light uh, for the entire 12 weeks, another group that had sham for the entire 12 weeks, and a group that had sham and NIR. And we found that when we looked at the response rate, um, the, they were pretty similar. There was really no difference. And uh, when you look at also at the total scores, they were very similar across the three groups. Um, so something didn't work here. And uh, um, the issue here is that the surface was too small. And what it means uh, that also the total energy that you're shedding is going to be very little. It was actually half of the energy that we had shed in the previous study. So shifting from low irradiance, large surface to low irradiance, and a uh, small surface uh, was really going to a rabbit hole um, where uh, we, are, we were basically heading to, to a dead end. Uh, now, we didn't do this on purpose. Uh, um, it just so happened that uh, certain areas uh, that uh, certain LEDs of our device were on hair, and uh, so the, the hair were shielding the light. So what happened though if instead of changing the surface, uh, we kept the surface constant and we changed the um, intensity. So for instance, from low to high. So uh, other groups uh, have dealt with this. Uh, there's another group uh, um, in Boston also that was at BU with Marnie Naser that has looked at low irradiance uh, and large surface in the subjects with a traumatic brain injury who had uh, a high comorbidity with depression. That is actually pretty common in traumatic brain injury. Uh, what, uh, what she had is this kind of bulky uh, groups of LEDs and she would move them around uh, uh, with uh, a total of 11 uh, spots on the head. So very large uh, surface. Of the eight subjects uh, who had uh, at least mild to moderate or severe depression, three, as you see here in the squares, um, had a remarkable decrease of their symptoms after six weeks of treatment. So these were also uh, repeated sessions. And so the rate of response here was uh, 37%, which was uh, interesting. And uh, um, you might think uh, this is not so high compared to what we had seen in our uh, study here at uh, Mass General for depression. Our uh, study with uh, uh, was uh, low irradiance uh, and also uh, large surface, um, so similar parameters to the ones used by Marnie Nazer at BU. However, um, these were subjects with uh, traumatic brain injury, so you might imagine um, maybe a little bit more of neurological comorbidity and uh, less response. Um, unfortunately, uh, when you look at the overall scores over time, uh, the effect uh, dissipated over time. And this was actually also our experience at MGH that, uh, you know, multiple sessions work to keep the effect going, but once you stop within two to four weeks, uh, the effect dissipates. Another group, uh, um, this was a group of uh, uh, chiropractors um, in Denver, Colorado, uh, that also teamed up with a psychiatrist uh, and neuropsychiatrist uh, that looked at the laser uh, devices and looked at the high radiance and large surface also in subjects uh, with traumatic brain injury that um, were coming to their office. Also subjects with a high comorbidity of depression. And so they kind of uh, chose to use their 
uh, technique that we're using on the body and using in the head and in basically sweeping uh, a large area of the head with uh, um, high irradiance uh, laser. So very different technique uh, um, with uh, now high irradiance uh, and uh, large surface. Irradiance and intensity are used here interchangeably. What they saw is a, a fairly significant depression at baseline. These subjects were followed for about eight weeks, sometimes less, and dramatic, dramatic changes uh, in their total scores uh, of, the, of the quids. And uh, no matter how they split the sample uh, based on how many sessions uh, they had uh, received, uh, uh, the effect was uh, uh, truly impressive. Um, the follow-up uh, in acute phase of this naturalistic study was eight weeks, uh, um, but they also reported uh, sustained effect uh, for uh, months, uh, um, up to two years uh, in this group, which was uh, very different from uh, the experience uh, we had with uh, all other type of interventions, so whether they were um, high radiance and uh, uh, low surface, or whether they were um, uh, low irradiance and large surface. So this is very interesting and quite remarkable. Of course, uh, this was a naturalistic study. Uh, you could imagine a selection bias uh, in the selection of patients, uh, patients that were maybe responding were more likely to stay at the clinic and eventually to be part of this naturalistic study. Um, however, even if the rate of response were lower, let's say uh, 50 or 60 percent, this was uh, still remarkable. Interestingly, from uh, the same cohort uh, of their patients with the same technique, uh, they showed here uh, that if they did expect uh, to measure cerebral blood flow and metabolism before and after uh, a six uh, um, weeks of treatment, um, pre is baseline and post is after six weeks, uh, the first uh, two rows, you see that uh, there are much more red spots in the post row at the end of the six weeks, uh, showing that uh, there was significant metabolic and uh, uh, blood flow effect of this um, high radiance, high surface uh, uh, technique uh, of photobiomodulation. So um, the question is, can we draw a road map, or a road map, I should say? Um, I guess we could. Um, and this is, um, of course, a speculation and uh, a, a framework, really, for the field, hoping that uh, we can uh, sort of agree on certain ways of delivering the light and studying the light. Um, we have seen at the very beginning, the upper left uh, corner, um, the, the very few studies uh, that have shown uh, the impact uh, of um, high uh, irradiance or high intensity with a small surface. And then uh, uh, on the right side, uh, the studies uh, that have uh, looked at large surface, uh, whether on the top with uh, high intensity or low intensity. Um, of course, uh, timing matter, and uh, I've reported here the total amount of energy that uh, was shed. So. Um, the time of exposure also matters uh, when it comes to these treatments. And uh, the upper right corner, as, as we said, um, the, the high intensity and large surface uh, seems extremely promising. And unfortunately, uh, the low uh, um, irradiance and small um, surface, uh, which is um, the, the left uh, uh, lower uh, corner. Uh, it was the rabbit hole where our group uh, ended up uh, finding uh, negative results. 
Now, uh, very encouraging, uh, our group was funded by the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, and uh, we are uh, starting to test this uh, roadmap. Um, we focus on the uh, left column. We're going to compare high radiance and uh, low irradiance. Um, and uh, it's a large study, it's a, a two-center study with uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston and NYU in New York. Uh, so uh, again, we're, we're very, very excited and we're specifically looking at cerebral blood flow. As you might remember um, those two studies um, on uh, high intensity, uh, high irradiance has shown that cerebral blood flow could be uh, modulated by uh, high irradiance. Um, so we're comparing that uh, effect, uh, um, the, that neurophysiological effect in high irradiance and low irradiance with small surface. Now, um, this roadmap uh, is uh, also a mechanistic roadmap. Uh, so what happens is that uh, and again, this is speculative, uh, but uh, it's hopefully uh, another framework for the field uh, to investigate. Uh, I just said here, looking at the left col column, that we're looking at cerebral, <coughs> excuse me, cerebral blood flow in, uh, um, excuse me, one second. Uh, I have here my Patriots bottle. our um, team from uh, Boston. So it was just water, by the way, for, the, for those of you that might have doubted. So um, high radiance um, could increase uh, uh, cerebral blood flow, and we could compare it with low irradiance. But the most important thing here is that uh, if you have high irradiance uh, um, cadaver models and uh, uh, computer simulations show uh, very good penetration of the light. And so there is uh, many direct effects on uh, neuromodulation that you could elicit. Um, some uh, already demonstrated in healthy subjects like uh, uh, increase in cerebral blood flow you see uh, for the high intensity uh, increase in brain oscillations, uh, e.g. recordings, uh, and also increase on in ATP levels. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, cytochrome C oxidase has been directly um, uh, affected uh, um, by high irradiance uh, in uh, uh, human subjects. Uh, and then uh, uh, if you look at the right column, if you use large surface, um, you can speculate that uh, you are broadly irradiating the bloodstream on the skin. And therefore, you have a, um, a, a large, a substantial effect on uh, circulating mitochondria. And that could have effects in the general system, systematic effects like antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects, effects that are known to be effects of the, of the light. And, uh, and those might in turn have antidepressant effects. Now, if you go down with low intensity, however, um, you might be losing some of the effects, uh, direct effects on the brain, and uh, uh, potentially still have some uh, effects on brain oscillations uh, that those have been shown in, uh, in healthy subjects. So with this framework, uh, uh, there is potentially a mechanistic reason why uh, the upper uh, right corner of high intensity and uh, large surface was so effective, uh, probably because you have this synergistic, uh, um, uh, mechanistically different effect on uh, uh, depression. So, in conclusion, uh, I hope that uh, uh, this is um, 
a mechanistic and uh, uh, clinical empirical framework that creates a roadmap uh, for the field uh, um, and that uh, we might agree that uh, there are different type of treatments uh, or different doses um, that have been used in the field uh, that might be um, mechanistically different, uh, somewhat different in the clinical uh, efficacy for depression. Um, and most of all, we might agree that we need the science uh, to come and to test these uh, different quadrants, uh, these different uh, options. I uh, want to also tell uh, all of you that if you are interested in more, please reach out. Uh, I'm, I'm interested always in collaborating. I, I'm eager to, to support others uh, who are interested in developing this field of photobiomodulation. Um, I want to thank uh, our group, uh, both the depression program uh, and uh, at the Division of Neuropsychiatry. And thank you all for uh, listening to my presentation today. Thank you.